Hello and welcome to the Outsider Art Podcast, Episode 19, Susan Takaharengi King, Part 2. This episode is going to be a little different from previous ones, as it will see me heading into uncharted territory as I explore some of Susan's artwork up close and first hand. For those of you who haven't heard Episode 18, which is part one of what I anticipate to be three episodes on Susan, I would suggest you take a listen to that episode. Episode 18 is an introduction to Susan and her biography, which I think will provide some useful context for this episode. Before I start, I would like to express my appreciation to the Susan Tikaharingi King Trust and to Petita Cole in particular, for allowing and facilitating my access to the archive. It has been a privilege to be able to spend several hours exploring Susan's work. I genuinely feel very fortunate to have had this rare opportunity. The archive is astonishing, all carefully organised and filed courtesy of Petita, and it helped me to begin to piece together Susan's development as an artist and brought into clear focus that Susan, in my opinion, is an artist of significance who deserves the same nuanced consideration as any prominent artist, past or present. There is a depth and complexity to Susan's work that flows through every piece, and as you flick through the folders, drawing after drawing presents itself as a new enigma to be unwound and interpreted. They ask a multitude of questions, and then demand much of the viewer in their hunt to unlock answers from the swirling mass of imagery. Susan Takaharingi King's work is not a light visual read. It is a challenge and an adventure, a sort of vision quest into Susan's mind. Critic Jerry Saltz first saw Susan's work when he attended the New York Outsider Art Fair in 2014. He called it the, quote, biggest new discovery of the week, end quote, and had this to say in his review in Vulture, quote, It is often said of so-called outsider art that it does not change, grow or develop. Each of King's drawings... They are made with graphite, coloured pencil, crayon, ink, or various types of pens, sometimes on both sides of the paper. Explore line, space, shape, surface, composition, colour, light, density, and touch in different ways. The 20 or so works at the fair were a sampling made between 1958 and 1963 included a strange abstract combinations or knitted together landscapes of cartoon parts, notably Donald Duck, arranged in ways that echo Willem de Kooning, Jim Nutt's meticulous piecing together of body parts and distortion, Rory Lichtenstein's stylized cartooning, and Carol Dunham's deft space and line. Much of her work could hold a museum wall next to these artists' work. End quote. There are a few things in this review that bear witness to what makes Susan's work so important and compelling. Saltz recognises that Susan is an artist who is evolving in her craft, even within the small five-year sample size of works he saw in the exhibition. Looking through Susan's archive, this evolution is writ large and speaks to the development of Susan as a person as well as as an artist. Her fascination with exploring cartoon characters, paraphernalia and the ephemera of memories in her art had all but disappeared by the time she stopped drawing in the early 1990s, having been swallowed, absorbed and concealed in works of more abstract form, many of which resound with an intensity that, with 2020 hindsight, appear to ring with a combination of desperation and quiet aggression. These works, created in the 1980s and early 1990s, 
are the ones I managed to get a sneak peek of during my first visit to the archive. And, like much of Susan's art, they shadow her life experiences. They are also the works that provided the jumping off point for when Susan resumed drawing again in 2008, after her 15 year long hiatus. One other point made by Saltz in his review is his comment that compares Susan's work with that of more well-known modern artists. This conversation between outsider art and the art establishment has been taking place since before the terms art brute or outsider art were even conceived. Most notably by the surrealists in the early 20th century. And this has continued both formally and informally ever since. It has evolved also, but in a non-linear way, and has included claims of inspiration, borrowing, theft, paternalism and denigration. Finally, it has landed where we are now, at a point that has been common within the art establishment for decades, a place of mutual appreciation and a genuine dialogue between artists and their art. So when Saltz talks about de Kooning or Dunham, or when the inner dust jacket of the drawings of Susan Takaharangi King mentions Sue Williams, Laura Owens and Joyce Pensato, it's now for the purposes of highlighting the shared commonalities and an aid of the search for a better understanding of the work in a discussion free of hierarchies. As I've mentioned previously, Susan's work takes time to unpack, and there are a few things that are worth knowing before you start. The first is that Susan never pre-plans her work on the page. There are no preliminary sketches, no lightly drafting out in pencil, and there's also no erasing. Once she draws something, it stays on the paper. However, many of her drawings, particularly her more recent ones, are multi-layered, in which former layers may be concealed by later ones. I spent some time earlier in the year with Susan and Petita at the awesome Aotearoa print studio watching Susan hand colour one of a series of lithographs she has completed at the studio. At the end of the session, while we tidied up and prepared to leave, Susan also drew a small abstract work on paper, and it was fascinating to observe her in action. If you want to see Susan at work, there are short videos on the at Susan Takaharangi King Instagram page. Watching Susan work, you can see that she is transported into a zone of concentration and that distractions which compete with her finishing her task are unwelcome. What is also very obvious watching her work is the exceptional degree of intention she applies. Her movements are precise with a clear sense of purpose, her choices of where and how to draw, methodical, what colour to use, deliberate. In the small abstract I mentioned, she would make a mark on one side and then cross to the other side of the paper and make a corresponding mark. It was like watching a kind of rally between two evenly matched tennis players. The archive of Susan's work comprises folders of art in various sizes. Some are tiny little scraps of paper with single figures on them, and they range up to sheets larger than A1. There are works on all manner of paper types from plain to pre-printed sheets from various sources that Susan has found or been given to draw on. There are pages that have been torn from drawing pads. Sometimes these tears have eaten into the artwork and there are numerous works that have been dated, often with notes by Susan's grandmother, Myrtle. What is fascinating about the range of different paper materials that Susan draws on is the way she responds to pre-existing marks on the paper. She often used them as a jumping off point for artistic innovation. An example of this is her workings on sheets which had pre-printed figures used for pattern design. These figures, with tiny dots lightly outlining their shapes, inspired Susan to, at first, be fairly faithful to the form of the printed figure. But over several drawings, these figures mutate into entirely different forms. 
still vaguely recognisable as humans, but now distorted. It could be read as a commentary on the mutability of the human form, which she contrasts boldly over an idealised body type. There's a lot to dive into within Susan's oeuvre, and I will only be able to scratch the surface as, and I'm not kidding, each of her pieces could sustain an entire podcast episode by themselves. In my first session at the archive, I found myself drawn to Susan's work prior to her artistic hiatus, which began around 1993 and went through to 2008. During the late 80s and early 90s, Susan's work became increasingly abstracted, both in terms of her predominant use of tight circular whorls and geometric and geological shapes and lines, and the decreasing number of figurative elements which were being abstracted, absorbed and hidden. Also noticeable was an emerging tendency towards horror vacui, the fear or dislike of leaving empty spaces, something which hadn't been a feature of Susan's previous work. In many works, the tight circular worlds dominate, like persistent weeds filling up the page. With the benefit of some knowledge of Susan's biography, I find these works to be confronting viewing. There's a claustrophobic intensity to them, which feels desolate and lost. I would hope that these works can be exhibited to the public in the future as they offer up, with some clarity, the precariousness of operating in a creative space. They also feature many of the visual themes that Susan would pick up and expand upon when she began drawing again in 2008, and therefore provide a line of continuity in understanding her artistic growth. On a recent visit to the archive, I took a more random approach, looking mainly at Susan's figurative work, and was rewarded with a clearer understanding of the breadth and depth of Susan's art. She is an artist who fearlessly experiments, and in doing so has produced a body of work that is delightfully original. There is, of course, no way of knowing whether Susan self-censors her work, either in terms of content or style, but to this viewer it seems entirely unfettered by any commonly understood conventions. It strikes me as being a place of free play of the imagination and constantly curious artistic innovation. The word play here is not meant in the pejorative sense as something frivolous and unplanned, but rather as a bold, conscious and inventive approach. Her willingness to test the dimensions of the flat space of the page, investigate all manner of juxtaposition, explore the unending malleability of the figure and reinterpret the ordinary means that every image is as distinctive as a snowflake. If I may indulge, I'll describe a few of Susan's work to give a small sampling of what I mean. One image, dated August 1969, has stick-like figures that look like children's toys posing on a page, some limbs made dangerous by the replacement of these body parts with sharp toothed saw blades and even a nasty looking leg trap. Posed in amongst these figures is Mickey Mouse, with stick figure arms and muscular human legs, one twisted at an impossible angle, the other with its foot either embedded in or replaced by a single dice. Mickey's chest is encased in a blackboard strapped on like a corset. Another work, dated January 25, 1968, is of the Auckland Harbour Bridge and is an exercise in construction detail and angularity. The bridge itself is squeezed into the top quarter of the vertical image. Below, and possibly under water, are jumbled concrete piles, braces, hooks, nuts and bolts, a hammer wound tautly with rope, and an angular seagull. Round circles, either underwater bubbles or holes punched in metal, the shell of a car, a strand of rope, water lines, and what looks like some shellfish buried at the bottom of the page, are the few objects that bow to the curve. It is a sort of image that takes something that people see every day and barely notice as they drive over it on their way to work and proposes it as something to be questioned and reconsidered, an alien construct in a natural world. 
There are many images of birds that feature throughout Susan's body of work, and it is not only Donald Duck or Tweety Bird. I found several pages filled with various species of birds, real and invented. Some executed in a cartoon style, others iconographic, and yet others tending towards the realistic. In one vertical image, undated as far as I could tell, a page of birds spans this gamut of styles, cartoonish, often with hands rather than wings, at the top, going down to more pragmatic depictions at the bottom. The figures are jigsawed together, limbs and bodies twisted to fit with each other in a composition that reminded me of a cave painting. The bottom left-hand corner has been torn off, so unfortunately we are unable to see the complete work. However, Susan has added a curious figure at the bottom right of the picture. A headless, armless, thin bulb shape atop a pair of legs, which the long neck of the bird above bends around elegantly. Speaking of birds, and I'm quite obsessed with the idea of landscapes seen from a bird's eye view, many of Susan's abstracts from the late 80s and early 90s through to her more recent works give the sense that we are looking down from above. Like a patchwork of fields and geographic features or topographic maps with concentric shapes undulating outwards, there's an overarching feeling that we are privy to a perspective on our world that we don't often see. For me, there's something grounding and calming about these works, even if they are sometimes filled to bursting off the page with intense detailing. As I mentioned previously, it is impossible to survey all Susan's work in a single podcast episode, so I want to just mention a few other observations I made while viewing her archive. There are certain original artistic tropes that Susan has played with during different periods, and I'd like to touch on a couple of these that are particularly interesting to me. One aspect of Susan's figurative work that is especially poignant is the way she explores the movement of bodies and her preoccupation with distorted and unusual perspective. In my previous career as an animation producer, I was privileged to be able to get under the hood, as it were, with how the illusion of movement is created. This is particularly true of traditional 2D animation. In 2D animation, there are what is known as key frames, which form the structure of the animation, and are where the main character poses exist. And then there are what are called in-betweens, and these are the frames drawn in order to get the character from keyframe to keyframe. It's in the in-betweens where you find some of the most radical drawings in 2D animation. In these frames you will find the animator doing things such as squashing, stretching and distorting the figures in order to move the character from key to key. As individual frames, these look bizarre, but when combined in sequence, they serve the purpose of forming a believable sense of movement for the character. This is something much of Susan's figurative work reminds me of. She will take a figure, or at times multiple figures, and manipulate them around the page in a variety of experimental iterations, exploring scale, form and unusual perspective in a way that feels like they are alive and interacting with their surroundings and other characters within the work. For me, there is a definite sense of intentionality to this, and a playful yet determined reasoning behind it. These examples of Susan's art are exercises in vibrant dynamism, cleverly captured within a single drawing, and are exploding with vitality. There is a certain truthfulness to them as well, for by capturing the in-between frames of life, rather than the carefully constructed, photoshopped, Instagram-ready poses, Susan reflects back at us the necessity to appreciate the effervescent reality of existence, rather than obsessing with reaching after the blandness of a perfect rendition. There are many examples available to view of Susan's figurative drawings. They are often intricately detailed and are best viewed in person if possible, or in as high definition as you can find. 
The work that initiated this digression is a sheet of drawings of Donald Duck in a variety of unorthodox poses, which reminded me of what's called a model sheet in animation. A model sheet is where the animation artist draws the character in various poses and from various perspectives in order to ensure that there is a standardization of the character's look, gestures and poses for animators to follow. Susan's Donald Duck model sheet would have created a pretty wild cartoon. The other theme that I wanted to touch on in this taster of Susan's work is the way she incorporated everyday objects and experiences into her figurative drawings. Scattered liberally throughout these fantastical works are mundane items, sometimes rendered with precise sincerity and others played with as curiosities that reimagine their original purpose and form. In episode 18, I mentioned the idea of Susan's work as evoking a kind of nostalgia, especially for the 50s, 60s and 70s, and it is these everyday objects that help place her art firmly in that space. I also mentioned that it is not necessarily a comfortable nostalgia, as Susan's work tends to push these objects between the lines and beyond their traditional roles, and in the visual context of her work, they come at you with a different meaning. Finding these objects is not always easy. They can be hidden, disguised or abstracted, and even if prominent, they may not be recognised, due to the viewer's unfamiliarity with them or a recontextualization of their purpose. Whether they are in the background or front and centre, their existence is a sign that Susan is a close observer of her environment, with an inquisitive mind as to how things work and where they sit in the world. We need to spend some time with Susan's work to be able to appreciate the intricacies of her drawings of ordinary everyday items and experiences, and even then, many of these cultural artefacts would likely pass you by. So, I would recommend you take a look at the at Petita Cole collection, all one word, on Instagram. Petita is responsible for Susan's archive and has over the years been compiling an astounding collection of memorabilia that relates to Susan's life and works. On her Instagram she highlights objects and documentation that sheds light on Susan's art. She has spent years working with Susan's archive and has an intimate knowledge of her drawings and the content within. Having grown up with Susan, she has an awareness of not only the cultural ephemera and everyday objects and happenings that were around, but also Susan's life experiences, which may have been incorporated into the work. What these drawn objects illuminate is the ability that Susan has, having seen them only once or perhaps just a few times, to recreate items accurately, or even more incredibly, recreate them as distorted but still recognisable. It is as if she has collected these items in her mind, made a precise visual recording that notes aspects of them that we may not ordinarily see, and then borrowed from this collection when needed in order to populate her work. It is a feat of astounding skill and talent. And speaking of feat, next time you get a chance to look at Susan's figurative work, Check out the feet. There's enough material there to last a foot fetishist a lifetime. And on that frivolous note, I'm going to call time on this episode. I really do feel that I haven't done Susan's work justice at all in this tiny bite-sized chunk of observations, and it's my hope that it will be more of a jumping off point for you to take a chance to see as much of Susan's work as you can. It goes without saying, but when you do get the chance to view the work of Susan Takaharangi King, look closely, take your time, and be open to having your perspective of the ordinary altered. Thanks again to Petita and the Susan Takaharangi King Trust for allowing me to access Susan's archive. It's been a wonderful and enlightening experience. Thanks also to Petita for assistance with the drafting of this and the previous episode. She may be single-handedly keeping the post-it note industry afloat. I apologise, as almost always, for the length of time it has taken to get this episode out to you. 
life has gotten away more than normal on this one. Look out for the next episode, part three on Susan Takaharangi King, which will be an interview with Petita. As always, I'll post a reading list and links onto the podcast website at shows.acast.com slash outsider dash art dash podcast. And I'd like to thank Hill East Phil from the US for an insightful review of the podcast. Your kind words are much appreciated. Anyone can rate and review the podcast. And though I'm not entirely sure how, it apparently helps others find the podcast. And it definitely boosts my mood and encourages me to carry on creating the slow dribble of content. I also received my first donation to the podcast from Anonymous. So thank you Anonymous. You know who you are and please know that I'm grateful for your contribution. Thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you next time on the Outsider Art Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>